Every year, humanity uses more than 25 million tons of copper, from the tiny wires running through our homes to massive plumbing systems and even giant power grids that light our cities. Meeting this huge demand can't depend on mining alone. The true solution lies in copper recycling. Scrap is collected and sorted with care, cleaned, melted, and refined to be reborn again. Each recycling cycle saves up to 75% of the energy compared to mining new ore. It also prevents millions of tons of CO2 emissions, and incredibly, copper can go through this process endlessly without losing quality. The old wires around you might just be waiting for a new beginning to once again become the backbone of modern civilization. In this video, we'll follow the incredible journey of copper's endless rebirth. Nearly 85% of all copper ever mined in history is still being used today. A clear reminder that recycling isn't just a side effort, it's a cornerstone of the world's copper supply. In the United States, about one-third of annual copper demand comes from recycled scrap. Collection includes everything from old wiring and plumbing to discarded electronics and retired infrastructure, all refined in advanced facilities to create pure copper, ready for every industry. But the true value goes far beyond money. In today's age of clean energy, the U.S. needs enormous amounts of copper for smart grids, EV charging stations, wind turbines, and solar farms. Recycled copper now acts as a critical strategic reserve, reducing dependence on new mining while keeping the flow of red metal steady, powering the defining technologies of the 21st century. When copper scrap arrives at the collection yard, it's often piled into huge heaps or packed into tight bales for easier handling. These sites aren't just temporary storage, they're the gateway to the entire recycling process. Here, workers begin the careful job of manual sorting, relying on experience and sharp eyes. Bright red copper, clean and pure, is set aside for higher value, while darker, greasy, or coated pieces wrapped in plastic or mixed with steel, go to other sections. The difference often comes down to tiny details, color, shine, or even how heavy it feels in the hand. But those details can decide the value of a whole shipment. In a typical yard, around 60 to 70% of the scrap can be reused after just basic cleaning. The rest includes alloys or heavily contaminated pieces, which need deeper processing. Sorting and organizing on site saves refining costs later and keeps the yard safer and more compact, reducing fire risks from leftover oil or residue. In this way, copper scrap yards form a vital link, turning chaotic piles of waste into a steady sorted flow of material with clear measurable value. After sorting, copper wires are fed straight into shredders. Whole coils and bundles go in at once for high volume processing. These machines use rotating shafts lined with hardened steel blades, powerful enough to rip through both plastic insulation and the copper core inside. As the bundles are pulled into the grinding chamber, they burst apart into a mix of fibers and fragments. Heavy copper settles on one side, while lighter plastic pieces drift to the other. The mixture then travels across multi-layer vibrating screens. Combined with air separators, under vibration, dense copper granules drop to lower levels while lighter plastic stays above and gets carried away by suction fans. Some facilities even add magnetic conveyors to pull out stray steel and bits of iron hidden in the wires. Thanks to this process, the tangled mass is separated into three clear material streams, clean copper, recyclable plastic, and other metallic residues. This method makes it possible to process huge volumes without the slow labor of manually stripping wires. Each ton of scrap cable can yield 400 to 450 kilos of pure copper, with the rest made up mostly of PVC or polyethylene. And importantly, even the separated plastics aren't wasted. Once cleaned and ground into fine pellets, they're reused to make pipes, liners, or even new cable jackets, giving them a second life. By combining bulk shredding with precision sorting, Scrap yards boost both speed and recovery efficiency, a crucial advantage when handling hundreds of tons of obsolete wiring every year. What once looked like a chaotic tangle becomes organized resource streams. 
Bright copper cores and industrial plastics ready for reuse. Once freed from plastic and other impurities, copper scrap is fed into powerful smelting furnaces. Most facilities use electric induction or arc furnaces capable of reaching over 1,085 degrees Celsius, copper's melting point, the moment solid metal turns to liquid. Inside the furnace, the scrap is heated with small doses of flux, which pull out the last bits of impurities, forming a thin layer of slag on the surface. That slag is skimmed off continuously, leaving behind pure molten copper below. What makes this step remarkable is that melting doesn't just liquefy the metal, it renews copper's life all over again. Each melt blends scrap from many different sources, electrical wires, brass shavings, and red copper from old plumbing. By combining them together, the final alloy can be tuned to exact needs from ultra-pure copper for conductors to specialized alloys for industrial machines. Energy use in recycling furnaces is impressively low, about one-fifth of what's needed to mine new ore. Yet the output remains just as efficient. A single melt can process dozens of tons of scrap, turning broken fragments into a continuous stream of glowing liquid metal ready for casting. It's here that copper reaches its turning point, where discarded remnants finish their old story and are reborn as pure metal for an entirely new purpose. From the furnace, the molten copper flows out, glowing deep orange-red at more than 1,985 degrees Fahrenheit. It's poured into giant ladles and carried to the casting line, where precision molds are waiting, ready to shape the liquid metal into standard forms. Depending on demand, it can be cast into long rods, thick slabs, or cylindrical billets for later rolling, drawing, or machining into finished products. Continuous casting is the most common method. Molten copper flows into a water-cooled mold. Its outer shell hardens instantly, while the inner core stays fluid as the strand is pulled downward. Powerful sprays of water complete the cooling process, producing a continuous bar of solid copper that can stretch for dozens of meters before being cut into uniform lengths. This stage is critical because it defines the strength and quality of the whole batch. Controlled cooling prevents internal cracks and keeps the grain structure perfectly aligned, giving the copper both durability and conductivity. Each bar, slab, or billet is then marked for traceability, linking it back to the exact furnace batch it came from. In just minutes, what was once a chaotic pile of scrap has been transformed into gleaming new blocks of industrial copper. These casts now form the foundation, ready to be rolled into wires, pressed into sheets, or alloyed for machinery, fueling the industries that depend on copper's unmatched versatility. Before moving on to the next phase, blister copper is reheated in specialized furnaces designed to deliver perfectly even heat. This reheating process stabilizes the metal's crystal structure, releases the internal stress left after solidifying, and warms the slabs to a level where their atomic bonds begin to relax. As the heat spreads evenly through the metal, trapped gases and small imperfections are also reduced, creating greater uniformity for the refining process ahead. Inside the glowing furnace, massive copper slabs slowly shift from rigid and brittle to soft and workable once again. After reheating and controlled cooling, the semi-pure blister copper enters its decisive stage electrolytic refining, inside enormous tanks stretching tens of meters long, each filled with a copper sulfate solution, CuSO4, mixed with sulfuric acid. Blister copper anodes hang alternately between thin stainless steel cathode plates. When a direct current is applied, copper atoms dissolve from the anode into the liquid, then migrate and redeposit onto the cathode surface, forming layers of copper that are almost completely pure. This refining process runs continuously for seven to 10 days, and along the way, something fascinating happens. Precious metals like gold, silver, platinum, and selenium don't dissolve in the solution. Instead, they slowly settle at the bottom of the tank, forming what's known as anode slime. 
Far from being waste, this byproduct is incredibly valuable. It's recovered and refined for use in jewelry, electronics, and chemicals. The final result of the process is flat, thin copper cathode sheets with 99.99% .99 purity, pure enough for even the most advanced electrical applications, from electronics to high-tech manufacturing. Each sheet weighs around 80 to 100 kilograms, stacked neatly on pallets for transport and traded globally, almost like a metal currency. From these cathodes, copper begins its next transformation, drawn into wires, rolled into ultra-thin foils, pressed into electronic circuit boards, or cast into precision industrial components. In some metallurgical plants, once the electrolytic refining is complete, pure copper cathodes are packaged and shipped directly. These thin, flat sheets, each weighing 80 to 100 kilograms, are stacked into tight bundles, strapped securely, and sold worldwide as a standardized international commodity. However, in most cases, cathodes leaving the refinery are remelted and cast into wire rods, cylindrical billets roughly 8 millimeters in diameter. This is the industry's standard intermediate form, bundled into massive coils weighing several tons, then shipped to wire manufacturing plants around the world. On the drawing lines, these wire coils pass through a sequence of rollers and drawing dies. Each pass reduces the cross-section and lengthens the strand, shrinking the diameter from 8 millimeters down to about 3 millimeters for residential wiring, or even a fraction of a millimeter for signal cables and microcircuit conductors. To prevent brittleness and cracking, the wire is continuously annealed under precise heat control, maintaining both flexibility and excellent conductivity. Once the target size is reached, the copper wire is coated with insulation, such as PVC, XLPE, or Teflon, depending on its final use. Finally, the finished wires are wound into large reels weighing between 200 and 500 kilograms, ready to power construction, utilities, transport, and technology sectors. From those original cathode sheets, copper has completed its transformation into wire, the essential backbone of modern infrastructure. In Korea, the art of copperware has a history stretching back thousands of years. It began during the Three Kingdoms period, one of Asia's earliest metallurgical eras. By then, Koreans had already mastered copper smelting, casting it into temple bells, incense burners, Buddha statues, and sacred ritual vessels. Archaeological discoveries reveal not just early metallurgical skill, but also the deep bond between craftsmanship and the spiritual life of the Korean people. At the heart of this legacy lies Bangja Yugi, a unique forging technique considered a national treasure. Unlike ordinary casting, which is done once and finished, artisans melt a copper tin alloy and pour it into rough molds, then repeat cycles of heating, hammering, and hand rolling dozens of times. Each strike of the hammer not only shapes the vessel, but also compresses the metal's grain, giving the final piece incredible strength, even heat distribution, and resistance to warping over time. As a result, Bangja bowls, spoons, pots, and trays are not only durable, but glow with a soft, golden warmth, cherished by Koreans as symbols of prosperity, purity, and harmony. Today, although modern industry has replaced much of traditional cookware, Bangja Yugi remains recognized as an intangible cultural heritage of Korea. During New Year celebrations and ancestral rites, many Korean families still choose Bangja dishes for ceremonial tables. More than simple utensils, each piece carries deep spiritual meaning, serving as a living bridge between the present and the timeless traditions of an ancient culture, a civilization shaped by copper and bound together through centuries of craft and faith. The journey of recycled copper is far more than a chain of technical steps. It's proof of how humanity has learned to give metal an endless life, reborn from what once seemed like worthless scrap. Copper can always return to purity, retaining its natural value and continuing to serve us across the most advanced industries. That's why nearly 80% of all copper ever mined still circulates today. A true rarity among materials where most degrade or disappear after use. It shows that copper recycling is more than an economic choice. It's a foundation for the world's transition to clean energy. 
From electric vehicles to renewable grids and smart technologies, a sustainable copper supply is now essential. Every ton of recycled copper means less pressure on the planet, less energy wasted, and fewer emissions released into the sky. It's the balance we strive for between progress and responsibility. And within this cycle lies a beautiful truth. The very atoms of copper lighting up today's cities may once have rung from ancient temple bells or been forged into tools and weapons thousands of years ago. Copper doesn't age the way we do. It simply changes form again and again. From monuments of the past to microchips and modern smartphones, it is the lifeblood of our civilization, connecting past, present, and future. That's why copper recycling stands as one of the clearest symbols of the circular economy's power, turning what was once discarded into the foundation for a new cycle of creation. Think about it. The home you live in, the car you drive, even the phone in your hand may contain copper atoms mined thousands of years ago. Share your thoughts in the comments, hit like and subscribe, and join us as we uncover more extraordinary life cycles of the materials that shape our world.